So where did your journey take you in piano from there? So my, my journey in piano was long and tiring and difficult and beautiful and everything. I cannot remember myself without the piano. I'm not, like I can't um, have a self, let's say, without the piano because I'm so connected to it for so many years. And when I was 19 years old, I applied for the Royal College of Music in London, like to study there, to do my bachelor's degree at the Royal College of Music, and I was accepted. And so I moved to London when I was 19 years old. I studied at the Royal College of Music. I did, actually I was very fortunate. Um, I was accepted as a third year bachelor student, directly in the middle of the bachelor's because of the high quality of the playing I had. So, um, kind of my talent gave me two years for free. And so I started um, my bachelor's there. I finished it within two years. I did two more years of postgraduate studies and a master's. So I lived in London for five years and I worked very much. And during that time, because I was also very, very uh, interested in poetry, uh, instead of playing just solo piano, being doing a solo career as a pianist alone, I started collaborating with singers and art song, which is something that I loved and then I had a full career in it because I always loved poetry, especially the German romantic poetry. So, and you know, the whole repertoire of art song is like based on German romantic poetry. And this includes Schubert and Schumann and Brahms and all these wonderful composers. So I did work very much with voice for many years. I then moved to Austria. I lived in Salzburg for two years and I studied at the Mozarteum and I did a specialization in German song. And then I went back to London and I was hired by the Royal College of Music as a junior fellow. So I worked as a pianist uh, at the Royal College of Music. So during all that time I kept working with singers and had a huge recital career in Europe, in, in Germany, in like Greece of course, uh, France and a lot in England. And I worked with many, many good singers who sang in Covent Garden and like big places. So it was a full, uh, full career in like as a piano accompanist, that's how we call it, as a piano collaborator with voice and sometimes with instruments and sometimes solo. So this is actually what I thought that my career would have been and would have gone on to be forever. But then this is when things changed. Is this when you ended up in Miami? So I ended up in Miami, totally by chance. It was because I had a family in Miami. I wrote to the University of Miami uh, and I said to them that I would also, um, though, welcome um, any kind of prospectus or any kind of opportunity they might have for my doctoral studies because I had already had my master's. So I sent my uh, CV and some like playing of mine, I sent um, some clips for them to listen. And I remember that the day after, like I turned, I opened the computer and there was an email inviting me to go and study in Miami, do my doctoral studies as a teaching assistant. And they were offering me full scholarship from the University of Miami. So it was not conducting even yet. And there we had another turn to the events because what happened then is that I had to take credits for the university and I didn't know what credits to take. and. So I decided to, instead of like going for hard stuff like analysis and things like that, I said, okay, I'm going to take conducting because it might be uh, like kind of easy to take conducting. I didn't know. <laughs> so I actually spoke to the conducting professor and I went to his class and his name is Thomas Slipper and he's one of the greatest teachers, educators and mentors in the whole of America. Um, and he has been my mentor for years. So I went to his class and I was like, my mind was fully blown because it was an amazing lesson that he gave us, the first lesson in conducting, which actually had nothing to do with moving our hands, but it had to do with what we have to do with our brains in conducting. And soon after that, to keep it short, uh, like a month in my lessons, a month and a half, he said to me that he really believed I should change my major and become a conductor. And this was the point that I looked uh, like scared at him back and I said to him, I can't, I'm a woman. And then he was even more scared than me and he looked at me back and he was like, what do you mean? Of course you can, 
you are a woman, yes, you can be a conductor, you can go to the moon if you want. And I had no idea I could do this, actually. So he said, I'll take you there, you'll study very hard, we'll work very, very hard for what you have to do. So I accepted the challenge and I did my audition with many other students that had master's degrees, so it was actually a pretty tough audition. I passed because he only accepted one student every four years, so I had a lot of time in front of the orchestra from day one. I stayed with him working for four years. I did my doctoral studies and then I did also an artist diploma, which was an extra um, qualification for me and more time with the orchestra. And during that time in Miami, I already auditioned for my first job. So I got the Broward Symphony Orchestra. Uh, I was their conductor. And then I got my second job, which was the Alhambra Symphony in Miami. I was their conductor. And then I got my third job, which was a cover conductor for Florida Grand Opera. So this was my life in Miami up to 2015, after finishing my studies and working as a conductor and also doing some freelancing in Europe and other places in America. Where did your journey take you after Miami? So I decided instead to move back to Europe and I thought, okay, I'm going to try to find things in Europe. So what happened is that they actually offered me the position of the chief conductor for the first serious youth orchestra in Greece, which was the youth orchestra called Musa in the Thessaloniki Concert Hall. So I accepted that position and that position started in September 2015 officially. Um, and then I was pregnant that same September and it was twins. And I announced uh, to them that I'm pregnant and we have to find solutions. Uh, for when time comes, like March or April, but actually they did fire me within uh, like a week uh, after I announced um, the pregnancy. They said to me in my face, like the artistic director of the concert hall back then said to me in my face that we don't want problems with pregnancy. The difficulty is the fact that I don't have an orchestra right now, like because actually it was a, a very uh, serious personal choice to not look for a permanent position because I wanted to bring up my kids myself. So I decided to stay home and only freelance. But as a freelancer, the difficulty comes to the point that you don't have an orchestra uh, that you kind of conduct. And in our world, when you have an orchestra that you are the chief conductor or the music director, then you can do exchanges with other orchestras and other conductors. So you can go to their orchestras, they come to yours. And in that way you can create a bit of more uh, momentum and a career. But in my case, not having an orchestra to myself makes things much more difficult. Uh, so I actually find it impressive even myself, uh, the fact that I've been working straight on abroad without having like the possibility to kind of share an orchestra with someone else, but I'm just being offered non-stop work abroad because as they say, they like my quality and my work ethic and they always invite me back wherever I've gone. You're the first female Greek maestro, aren't you? So I am the first Greek woman with a doctorate in orchestral conducting. And then I'm certainly one of the few that are working uh, full time and live of this and especially working abroad. I'm certainly the one that is working abroad full time all the time. And then how did you end up in Australia 